Good afternoon, ladies and gentlemen. I'm Arthur Brooks, president of the American Enterprise Institute. On January 8th, 1964, that's 50 years ago today, as all of you know, President Lyndon B. Johnson declared a war on poverty. So how's the battle going? There have been ups and downs in the past half decade, but the past half, sorry, past half century, but the past half decade has given us a little bit of reason for, for pessimism, I'm sorry to say. Labor force participation is at its lowest level since the 1970s. Disability insurance, which is a kind of permanent unemployment for many Americans, has surged by 20% since January of 2009. Unemployment among African American teenagers is at 38%, and the bottom half of the income distribution effectively has zero economic growth and unemployment rates that are the same as the Great Depression. Like me, many of you in this room started off with little or no money. But today, if you started out that way, the circumstances are such that you would have a much harder time getting to where you are. This is not right. The administration is very quick to blame the Great Recession, and, and everybody knows there's been a fierce headwind from the economic crisis. But ultimately, you know that there will be no excuses. History will assign responsibility for what's going on with America's poor to this president and this Congress. Unless there's real progress, the past five years will be remembered as a time when America lost ground in the war on poverty. For the sake of people who need our help and are being left behind, it's time for new ideas that move our country past tired dogmas of class warfare that vilify some Americans simply to appease others. New ideas are why we are here this afternoon. We're going to hear from Florida Senator Marco Rubio on a conservative reform agenda for combating poverty. Senator Rubio has been a tireless proponent of opportunity conservatism, and he today presents what are, in his view, the best new ideas to aid people who are truly vulnerable, truly in need. Marco Rubio is in the business of fighting for people, which is what our movement is all about. We're excited to hear what he has to say. His speech will be about half an hour, after which time we'll have a few minutes for questions and answers. Ladies and gentlemen, Senator Marco Rubio. Thank you. Thank, thank you for hosting this. Thank you to AEI for hosting this. Thank you for all of you for being here today, and I'm honored and privileged to be the opportunity to do this um, on this important day. You know, my, my mother was one of seven girls. Who, whose parents often went to bed hungry at night so their children wouldn't have to. My father had it even tougher. He lost his mother when he was about nine years old, and he had to leave school and go to work at a local restaurant. He was about the same age as my oldest son is now. My parents, like most people that ever lived, were raised in a country where they felt trapped by the circumstances of their birth. But just 90 miles away, there was this country where through hard work and perseverance, anyone could get ahead. And so they came there. They came here. They came here with virtually nothing. Now, the first years in America were difficult. They, they worked long hours for little pay. But they kept on. And over time, their lives improved. They never became rich. They never became famous. And yet my parents lived the American dream. Because like most people, for them, happiness was not about becoming wealthy. It was about finding work that paid a livable wage. It was about a happy family life, being able to retire with security, and being able to give their kids the chance to do anything they wanted. My, my parents' story of two everyday people who were given the chance to work their way into a better life, it's a common story here in America. It's a defining national characteristic rooted in the principle that's at the core of our nation's birth that every single human being has a God-given right to live freely and to pursue happiness. And this conviction has proven to be far more than just a line in our founding document. It's become the shared and defining value of us as a nation and as a people. It, it has set America apart, and it has attracted people here from every corner of the earth. The visionaries, the ambitious, the, the people who refuse to accept the stagnant ways of the old world, they came here. They brought their ideas and they brought their dreams and finally, free from the restraints of the old world, 
they helped build the most prosperous nation in human history. Now, we're still a country where through hard work and perseverance, you can earn a better life. The vast majority of Americans today live lives much better than their parents. And yet we are rightfully troubled because many of our people are still caught in what seems to be a pervasive, unending financial struggle. It bothers us because as a people, we're united by the belief that every American deserves the equal opportunity to achieve success. Now, 50 years ago today, Lyndon Johnson, President Lyndon Johnson, sought to address the plight of poverty by waging a war against it. On that day, he stood before a joint session of Congress and he vowed that it will not be a short or easy struggle. No single weapon or strategy will suffice, but we shall not rest until that war is won. His very next sentence served as a small window into his big government vision for this war and to its future failures. He said that the war on poverty, the richest nation on earth can afford to win it. And with those words, he foreshadowed the belief that still held by liberals to this day, that government spending is the central answer to healing the wounds of poverty. Today, the debate on poverty is primarily focused on the growing income gap between rich and poor. From 1979 to 2007, the income for the highest earning Americans grew by more than it did for anyone else. From 1980 to 2005, over 80% of the total increase in income went to the top 1% of Americans. And these are startling figures, and they deserve our attention. But if we focus on that alone, it doesn't give us a complete picture or a full view of the problem that is before us. Yes, the cashier at a fast food chain makes less money than the CEO of the company. But the problem we face is not simply the differences in the gap between pay between them, but rather that too many of those cashiers are stuck in the same job for years on end, unable to find one that pays better. And it is that lack of mobility, not just the income inequality, that we should be focused on. Now, for most Americans, their, their primary aspiration is to achieve a better life. For some, that means becoming wealthy, and there is nothing wrong with that. But for most, they just want to live a happy and fulfilling life like my parents, to earn a livable wage and a good job, to have the time to spend with family and to do the things they enjoy, to be able to retire with security and to be able to leave their kids better off than themselves. The good news is that even in the midst of our recent economic struggles, most Americans have been able to do that. For example, close to 50% of the people on the bottom fifth of the income scale in 1996 had climbed into a higher income bracket less than 10 years later. Many of these Americans have children that have gone on to earn even more. 84% of Americans have higher family incomes than their parents had when they were the same age. And among all income levels, the current generations are making more and doing better than the ones that came before it. The problem is that for some Americans, this kind of mobility isn't happening. For example, 70% of children born into poverty will never make it to the middle class. The uncomfortable truth is that there are now a number of other countries with as much or more opportunity than ours. In fact, more people in Canada go on to surpass the income of their parents than in the United States. Now, America is still the land of opportunity for most, but it is not a land of opportunity for all. And if we are to remain an exceptional nation, we must close this gap in opportunity. So why are so many poor Americans trapped at the bottom? Why are so many working harder than ever only to find their dreams slipping further away? Why do so many suffer from this growing and nagging sense of insecurity, knowing that they're one bad break away from losing everything they work so hard for? Well, there are a number of reasons. For one, the, our modern day economy has wiped out many of the low-skilled jobs that once provided millions with a middle-class living. Those that haven't been outsourced or replaced by technology are paying wages that just don't keep pace with the increase in the cost of living. And even some of the middle-skilled jobs, white and blue-collar jobs, 
have also been lost to automation or shipped overseas. Now, until at least a few decades ago, our economy proved sufficiently dynamic and innovative to replace old jobs with new ones. But that hasn't been happening in recent years. Social factors also play a major role in denying equal opportunity. The truth is that the greatest tool to lift people, to lift children and families from poverty, is one that decreases the probability of child poverty by 82%. But it isn't a government program. It's called marriage. 50 years ago today, when the war on poverty was launched, 93% of children born in the United States were born to married parents. By 2010, that number had plummeted to 60%. It shouldn't surprise us that 71% of poor families are families with, poor families with children are families that are not headed by a married couple. Now, the decline of marriage and the increase in the percentage of children born out of wedlock is it's being driven by a complex set of cultural and societal factors. But there's an interesting impediment to marriage worth keeping in mind. There's a 2011 report by the Pew Research Center that found that 64% of adults with a college degree are married. But only, four, but only 47% of those with a high school education or less are married. A lack of education is contributing to inequality in other ways as well. The jobs that have been replaced, the jobs that have replaced the low and middle skilled jobs of the past, they pay more, but they require a higher level of professional, technical, and management skills. And we simply have too many people who have never acquired the education needed to attain those skills. Here's what's worse. Children from lower income families are the least likely to get this kind of advanced education. And the result is this vicious cycle of intergenerational poverty. These economic, social, cultural, and educational causes of, of uh, opportunity inequality, they are complex. And they're overlapping. And they're interrelated. And they will not be solved by continuing with the same stale Washington ideas. Five decades and trillions of dollars after President Johnson first announced the war on poverty, the results of the big government approach are in. And here's what they are. We have four million Americans who have been out of work for six months or more. We have a staggering 49 million Americans living below the poverty line. We have over twice that number, over 100 million people who get some sort or form of food aid from the federal government. Meanwhile, our labor participation force is at a 35-year low, and children born or children raised in the bottom 20% of national income have a 42% chance of being stuck there for life. Now, our current president and his liberal allies, what they propose to address this, their proposal is let's spend more on these failed programs and let's increase the minimum wage to $10.10. This really this this is their solution to what the president has called the defining issue of our time? Raising the minimum wage may poll well, but having a job that pays $10 an hour is, is not the American dream. And our current government programs, at best, offer only a partial solution. They help people deal with poverty, but they do not help people emerge from poverty. The only solution that will achieve meaningful and lasting results is to provide those who are stuck in low-paying jobs with the real opportunity to move up to better-paying jobs. And to do this, we have to focus on policies that help our economy create those jobs and policies that help people overcome the obstacles between them and those jobs. The war on poverty accomplished neither of these two things. But we can achieve these two goals. First, because we have the single greatest engine of upward mobility in human history at our disposal, the American free enterprise system. F real free enterprise, by the way, isn't wealth accumulating in the hands of a few and leaving everyone else behind to, to live off the crumbs and the leftovers. And real free enterprise is not, as some in both parties have forgotten, corporatism, where those with the power to influence government win at the expense of everyone else. Real free enterprise is about a broad and growing economy that creates opportunities for everyone to get ahead. Real free enterprise creates the opportunity to become wealthy, 
but it also creates good and stable middle class jobs, like the one my parents had. But instead of fostering a vibrant free enterprise economy, our federal government is a major impediment to the enterprise and ingenuity of our people. An expensive tax code, burdensome regulations, and an unsustainable national debt are suffocating our economy's ability to create enough steady and good paying jobs. That's why poverty and inequality, by the way, has gotten worse under the current administration. Instead, we need policies that make our country the easiest and the best place in the world to create good paying jobs. This means removing the uncertainty created by a dangerous and growing national debt. This means enacting simple and affordable tax code reforms that incentivize investment. And it means eliminating regulations that prevent employers from expanding and prevent our energy sector from growing. But we can't stop there. Allowing free enterprise to flourish alone is not enough. We also have to address the complex and interrelated societal, cultural, and educational impediments that are also holding so many people back. A child born into a poor and broken family, living in a dangerous and violent neighborhood, and forced to attend a dysfunctional school, that child is in all likelihood going to ha not have the same opportunities to succeed as a child growing up in a stable home in a safe neighborhood and attending a good school. An unwed mother with a poor education and abandoned by the father of her children is going to face significant challenges to a better life. The poverty found in rural areas have some characteristics that are very different from the poverty you find in urban areas and inner cities. These are complex problems. And our current collection of overlapping government programs ignore and sometimes even exacerbate them. Instead of continuing to pour money into our existing programs, we need to reform them through innovative and highly targeted solutions. And here's the problem. That's not something the federal government is capable of delivering. Washington is too bureaucratic and too resistant to change. And it's one-size-fits-all approach to policy. It's just not conducive to solving a problem as diverse and complex as this one. Therefore, what I am proposing today is the most fundamental change to how the federal government fights poverty and encourages upward mobility since President Johnson first conceived the war on poverty 50 years ago today. I am proposing that we turn over Washington's anti-poverty programs and the trillions that are spent on them to the states. Our anti-poverty program should be replaced with a revenue neutral flex fund. We would streamline the most of our existing federal anti-poverty funding into a single agency. Then each year, these flex, funds, these flex funds would be transferred to the states so they can design and fund creative initiatives that address the factors behind inequality of opportunity. This worked in, 19, in the 1990s with welfare reform. In that case, Congress gave the states the ability to design their own programs, and in turn, the states enacted policies that promoted work rather than dependence. And in the years that followed, this led to a decline in poverty rates and welfare expenses. However, despite this success of welfare reform, Washington continues to rule over the world of anti-poverty policymaking, with beltway bureaucrats picking and choosing rigid nationwide programs and forcing America's state, elected state legislatures to watch from the sidelines. As someone who served nine years in the State House, two of them a speaker, I know how frustrating that is. It's wrong for Washington to tell Tallahassee what programs are right for the people of Florida. But it's particularly wrong for it to say that what's right for Tallahassee is the same thing that's right for Topeka and Sacramento and Detroit and Manhattan and every other town, city, and state in the country. A nation as large and as diverse as the United States, with a problem as large and as diverse as this one, should have a menu of state-level policy options that are just as large and, as, and diverse. And already we see evidence that when states can manage the resources necessary to experiment with such programs, the result is dynamic and transformative results. For example, while Washington debates how and whether to fund the existing unemployment insurance programs, states are finding innovative approaches to get people into good paying jobs. In Utah, in order to continue receiving unemployment benefits, 
the long-term unemployed were required to take online training courses that focused on skills needed for modern professionals, with topics spanning from resume building to career direction to interview skills. The state tracked the progress of the participants, and here's what they found. That before the courses, their professional preparedness was at the equivalent of a D plus. But upon completion of the training, their preparedness had climbed to a B plus. And remarkably, what began as a requirement quickly turned into a sought after tool. 36% of participants in this program found the courses so helpful that they voluntarily completed more training than what was required. It also helped them find a job faster, by the way. Among the test group, unemployment duration was reduced by 7%. The program has now been taken statewide in Utah, and a 7% reduction in the duration of benefits is expected to save $16 million annually, not to mention the boost to the state's economy and culture from a more engaged labor force. A similar program was attempted in Mississippi. Only in that case, participants increased their preparedness by a staggering 31%. Another in Kentucky found that workers spent 2.2 weeks less on unemployment insurance benefits when required to take training courses. These are the kinds of innovations we're looking to unleash. And not just with unemployment insurance, but throughout the entire web of government assistance programs. Right now, these kinds of innovations are difficult, if not impossible, to pursue because Washington controls the money. But I know from my time in the Florida legislature, that if states were given the flexibility, they would design and pursue innovative and effective ways to help those trapped in poverty. And as we've seen, they can put in place programs that give those currently stuck in low-wage jobs access to job training systems. They could put in place relocation vouchers that will help the long-term unemployed move to areas with more jobs. They could remove the marriage penalties and safety net programs like Medicaid. And they could enact nearly an infinite number of other nimble and targeted reforms to address the needs of their people. By allowing, let me, you know, allowing the states greater control doesn't mean Washington gets to wash its hands of the problem. There will still be a role for the federal government to, to play. For example, we should pursue reforms that encourage and reward work. That's why I'm developing legislation to replace the earned income tax credit with a federal wage enhancement for qualifying low-wage jobs. This would allow an unemployed individual to take a job that pays, say, $18,000 a year, which on its own is not enough to make ends meet. But then they receive a federal enhancement to make the job a more enticing alternative to simply collecting unemployment insurance. Unlike the earned income tax credit, by the way, my proposal would apply the same to singles as it would to married couples and families with children. It would also be a preferable means of distributing benefits since it would arrive in sync with a monthly or bi-weekly paycheck rather than a year-end lump sum credit. And it's a better way of supporting low-income workers than simply raising the minimum wage. Now, of course, an enhancement like this is going to have to be highly targeted so that it avoids fraud or abuse. And the amount's going to depend on a range of factors. But we know that by promoting work over dependence, this reform will incre increase workforce participation, especially in struggling communities. And that, in turn, would have a numerous social, economic, and cultural benefits to areas hard hit by the Great Recession and our recent economic challenges. Ultimately, however, any reform effort will be incomplete if it fails to facilitate the ultimate wage enhancer, skills training for those in low-wage jobs. Many people in these jobs, they don't have the time or the money to pursue a traditional education. But we can help them by bolstering and reinvigorating our nation's existing job training system. While our workforce delivery system must be driven by states, the federal government can help. It can help address the shortages in many skilled labor jobs by creating more pathways towards obtaining their certification credentials and by encouraging alternatives to the traditionally accredited college degree. Unlike our current programs, Targeted reforms such as these address the causes of opportunity and equality, not just the consequences. And as a result, they will help move us closer to a day when widespread poverty is a memory. And equal opportunity is available to more people than ever before. 
This erosion of equal opportunity is among the greatest threats to our exceptionalism as a nation. But it also provides us what I think is an exciting and historic opportunity to help more people than ever achieve the American dream. The millions currently trapped in poverty and despair are a tremendous untapped resource for America. Just think what it would mean for our country, for America, to gain the full use of the talents and abilities of all her people. They would develop new innovations to improve our lives and help build the next great American company. They'd be doctors in our hospitals and scientists in our labs. They'd be customers for our businesses and partners in our investments. They'd be leaders in our government and pastors in our churches. We are a great country despite the fact that we have over 40 million people stuck in poverty. Imagine how much greater we would be if they were not. Imagine how much greater we would be if the dreams and the talents of over 40 million people, 40 million human beings, were unleashed into our economy and into our lives. Now, I haven't been in Washington long, but I've been here long enough to know that everything here gets analyzed through the lens of electoral politics. But upward mobility and equal opportunity is, is not and should not be a partisan issue. It's our unifying American principle. And it's always been a focus of my public service, going back to my days as a state representative. Because for me, this issue is deeply personal. I'm a generation removed from poverty and despair. Where would I be to me, if, where would I be today if there had never been an America? What kind of lives or futures would my children have if this was not a land of opportunity? What if my father had been stuck working as a bar boy his whole life instead of making it to head bartender? What kind of life would I have right now? In all likelihood, I too would be on the outside looking in, forever frustrated that because my parents had no power or privilege, I was unable to achieve my full potential. Our status as a land of equal opportunity, it has made us a rich and powerful nation. But it has also transformed lives. It has given people like me the chance to grow up knowing that no dream was too big and no goal was out of our reach. Some of my earliest memories are of my parents and my grandfather instilling in me the belief that I could strive to achieve for myself whatever kind of life I wanted, even though they had humble beginnings themselves. Now there are those trying to access these same opportunities. Working in this very building, there are struggling parents trying to give their children what my parents gave me. Within walking distance of this very place, there are children growing up like I did, with dreams just like mine. And whether or not they get the chance to improve their lives will determine whether we remain a special country or become just like everybody else. For 50 years now, we have tried big government, and yet too many people remain trapped in despair. Now we must try a new way, one that addresses the things that are keeping so many people from the better life they want. For the idea that everyone deserves a chance, that still binds us together as a people. Despite our many challenges and our differences, this is still who we want to be. And that's why I know that like those that came before us, we are going to solve this problem. Because in the end, I believe we will do what Americans have always done, whatever it takes to keep America special. Thank you for the chance to address you.